The purpose of this brief presentation is to provide an introduction to covenant theology. And if you watched the presentation on dispensational theology, I was trying to provide a framework to help you understand uh, Daryl Bach's approach to Luke Acts, and specifically the way he deals with Gentiles and Israel and the relationship between Israel uh, and the church. And so although this has not been presented at all, um, in your textbook, I would like to look at this issue of um, covenant theology. So first of all, what is covenant theology? Uh, covenant theology primarily emerged from uh, Reformed theology. Actually, Horton, in his, took, uh, in his book, Introducing Covenant Theology, he actually equates the two. Um, it is important to notice that, to take note that some Reformed theologians may actually kind of lean towards a dispensational interpretation at times. So I don't know if I would necessarily equate the two as he does, but it certainly does emerge from that theological tradition. And if you read like a systematic theology such as a Wayne Grudem, and I'll be drawing on some of his material here in this presentation, he does lean towards a kind of covenant approach um, to systematic theology. So covenant theology emphasizes the centralizing role of the covenants in God's plan for creation and redemption. So where dispensationalism sees the dispensation or administrative idea as the emphasis, covenant theologians see the covenant as the centralizing idea. And so they define covenants as um, a compact or an agreement which God established as a reflection of the relationship existing between the three persons of the Holy Trinity. So we'll get to this in a moment. There are three core covenants. The most important, the foundational covenant, the covenant of redemption, actually is a covenant between uh, the three members of the Godhead. And so the other covenants and the covenants that deal with God's interaction with man then flow out of that covenant. That's a really um, kind of key concept here. Grudem defines a covenant as an unchangeable, divinely imposed legal agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of their relationship. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, Horton will later argue that the Mosaic Covenant actually does not fit into this unchangeable covenant category, that it's actually a kind of covenant of works that can be, um, I guess, uh, broken by humans. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, also important here is the idea that these covenants are unchangeable in that uh, they may be superseded or replaced by uh, a different covenant but they may, may not be changed once they're established. So that's why we see a kind of progressive movement here too. So um, Revelation is moving progressively uh, from God's dealings with Israel towards his dealings with uh, all the nations in the New Testament. So Horton suggests that, um, and we'll get to this again, that the Mosaic Covenant does not belong to that class uh, of covenant. So there are three uh, core covenants which exist. The first is the covenant of redemption. And this is an eternal pact between the persons of the Trinity with the intention to provide redemption in Christ. So in Christ is a, a term I'm going to point out here. Um, this whole concept of covenant theology is also known as federalism, which is um, going to point us to this concept of in Christ in just a moment. The second covenant, then, is the covenant of works. And this is the covenant with Adam in Eden. So it's sometimes known as the covenant of creation or the Edenic um, covenant. And that's the covenant in which God promises blessing on Adam for obedience and death upon disobedience. So it's important to note here that in covenant theology um, that it can be called federalism or headship. Uh, because it focuses on elements such as law and grace or being in Adam or being in Christ. So now that Adam has broken this initial covenant of works, all humans are actually in Adam or we're in sin. And so we need a solution to this. God already planned for that in the covenant of redemption. And now we move to the covenant of grace. And this is really Genesis 3 through the rest of Scripture. It all deals with the covenant of grace and the outworking of God's covenant of redemption. So when humans failed the covenant of works, God established 
uh, this covenant with humans. And it provides salvation by grace through faith because Christ fulfills the covenant of works. Right? So Christ fulfills that uh, earlier covenant with Adam. And he becomes the kind of new Adam. And we can have the opportunity to be in Christ. So the covenant of grace, uh, grace is one consistent covenant from the Abrahamic covenant to the new covenant in Christ. And so whatever we see being played out from Old Testament through the New Testament, it's really one story and one covenant, one redemptive um, path for humankind. There are two views on the Mosaic Covenant as they relate to this whole concept of the Covenant of Grace. And the first view is that the Mosaic Covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic Covenant. So it belongs under this category of the Covenant of Grace. And it and it's, has a certain kind of stress on the formation of Israel as a nation who has a law that God has given to her. Uh, this exists temporarily until the Messiah comes. So Horton, or those who might embrace this view, actually calls this a theocratic parenthesis um, or a temporal land grant. So think about this. This is the reversal, right? So the dispensationalists would say that the church age is a parenthesis, or at least in the classical dispensationalist view, the covenant theologians are actually saying the Mosaic law is the parenthesis and that it's all driving towards um, this future kingdom presence and the new, new covenant, actually. The second view here is uh, one espoused by Horton in his text, and he sug actually suggests that the Mosaic covenant is a covenant of a different order. It's not actually an eternal covenant, but it's a suzerain. Uh, um, if you get into Old Testament um, kind of culture and such, you, you learn about these suzerainty uh, treaties, and um, he suggests that that's the category of this of the Mosaic Covenant. And the indication here uh, that it belongs in that category is that it's filled with these kind of conditional statements. And that if you specifically look at Deuteronomy 28, um, Israel will be blessed for their obedience and they'll be cursed for their disobedience. And that's why it falls, in his view, more under the covenant of works, not really the covenant of grace. Um, and this means that um, obedience kept them in the land. So that's what the Mosaic Covenant was all about. If they were obedient, they would be in the land as a nation. Um, but it didn't save them. That takes us back to the covenant of grace. And so um, it's God's grace in our response of faith that actually saves Uh, what about the future of Israel in, in uh, covenant theology? Um, it's critical to understand that the Old Testament Jews are saved by grace through faith, not their obedience to the law. This is uh, important to most dispensationalists as well, but uh, really important to, in covenant theology. So Horton writes, No Israelite was ever justified by works, uh, but the nation had to keep the conditions of the law in order to remain in possession of the earthly type of the heavenly rest. And then um, those Gentiles or Jews who respond to God's grace in, in, in faith are really the true Israel or the true church. And so in this view, distinguishing Israel and the church um, is really not helpful for covenant theologians. Um, also, it's important to point out that covenant theology should not be equated necessarily with replacement theology or supersessionism. Now, some of them might be B. Some covenant theologians might be in this category. Um, but that idea, replacement theology or supersessionism, actually claims that the church replaces Israel. And so most um, covenant theologians will say that that's really not helpful. Um, that the key here is really to see um, the members of the church in Israel uh, as God sees them, as people who have faith, right? And so they are the true seed of Abraham. They're the true Israel. They're the true church. And uh, it's also important to note that God still does have a future for Israel. Uh, and, you know, we see that in Romans 11. Covenant theologians do recognize that. But this is what Horton points out. 
it is their future is by extensive pruning and grafting at the level of individual salvation through Christ. So the issue is still, will they respond to Christ? And um, will they be in him? And so that is something that is quite helpful in the covenant theology approach. So uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of wrap up here uh, by developing a kind of general kind of theology of the church and point out some things here in that general theology that kind of point towards a covenant theology view. I, personally, I tend, I, I see the benefit of dispensationalism, but I, I lean a little bit towards the covenant theology approach. And so um, that's what I'm trying to do is present a, a few other um, ideas here that might be helpful to you. So if we look at a definition of the church, the church is the community of all true believers for all time, right? So we're thinking here really about the universal church, those people who are in Christ, right? And so uh, the biblical term or the Greek word that's used is ekklesia, and it really means assembly or called out ones. And in the New Testament usage here, it can refer to a political, a formal political assembly. In, in classical Greek, actually, it was a term for the assembly of citizens summoned by a crier or an, a, a legislative assembly. It can be used in the New Testament to refer to the formal assembly of Christians. So it takes on a kind of formal um, definition as we move into the epistles. And this gathering can be said then to occur in a house or actually in a region such as Judea and Samaria. So it's not necessarily that actual physical gathering uh, that is absolute for using this term. And then it can be used to refer metaphorically to an unassembled assembly. And so it has like a kind of universal or, or kind of organic uh, sense to it. It's also important to note that ecclesia is used extensively in the Septuagint, right? That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it translates the Hebrew word kahal, which means congregation or assembly. And that has a, a broad range of meaning, um, but it usually refers to the people of God or Israel, right? So even this term church uh, is used in the Septuagint to refer to Israel. As we continue to think about uh, the, the nature of the church, there are a number of biblical metaphors that are helpful. And uh, I'm not going to read all of these, but there's family, the body of Christ, the people of God, the flock of God, the bride of Christ. Um, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So what I want to point out here is that we should notice that several of these metaphors overlap with Old Testament images of the people of God. And actually, Peter employs a number of metaphors which make a direct link between the New Testament church and the Old Testament people of God. So, we are the new temple, a royal priesthood, a chosen race, a holy nation. A nation. In fact, he says that we are God's people. So, the biblical authors seem to actually um, be quite intentional about associating the church with this people of God the people who are um, the true people of God. And in concluding, I just wanted to make a comment about the church. When did the church begin? And so if we take a covenant theology approach here, what we would say is that the church, uh, as that invisible group of people who truly respond to God's gracious initiative, existed before Christ came to die. So we should remember that Israel is called the assembly of God, the church. However, there is a kind of technical use of uh, the church in a visible sense, which takes on a new identity at Pentecost. We need to be really clear about that. And so the work of the Spirit takes on a new dynamic at this beginning point uh, of the church. And the result is uh, new power, and the result is the uniting of Jews and Gentiles into the one new man, Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 3. Um, and he calls that this mystery of the body of Christ. And the result is also a growing distinction between the church and unbelieving Jews. And so Bach does a great job of pointing that out, um, but uh, dispensationalists would, would appeal to that as well. So as you read through Bach, I hope that uh, you'll 
through these presentations be able to appreciate a little bit more of his perspective in that you'll have here uh, with this presentation a kind of alternative uh, for how you might uh, want to um, approach this. I'm including some references here that you might find helpful and I'll try to include some of this in the course shell as well. Thank you so much.